Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome. It is a great joy to welcome you to First Baptist Church of Greensboro. We are so pleased that you are here, that of all places you could be, you have chosen to be in this place. And we know that you are here with that shared sense of anticipation that we have, that we meet God when we gather in this place, and that through the power of the Spirit, we become together something we could never be alone, a community of the living God who is with us and greets us even now. So welcome into that, especially if you are a guest with us today. We hope that you already sense God's Spirit in this place. We hope that you have felt it in the welcome you have received already. We hope that you'll experience it in community and most of all in worship, that this will all make a difference in your life and help you to know more who God is and who God is calling you to be. This is a day in worship where we are gathered around the theme of going back to school, getting back in a rhythm, many of us, of the fall. And so we know we welcome a lot of kids and families today. We say a special welcome to you. Glad to see some backpacks out there and look forward to that blessing of the backpacks later in the service. And it reminds all of us of how God is speaking in this world and how that happens through each of us. And so today we gather around the story of Samuel, Samuel who's lying down in the dark when he hears a voice, he doesn't know what the voice is, but the voice is calling his name, and he comes to learn that it is God, it is the Lord speaking to him, to his very life. And so may all of us hear the same today in our own ways, and may this time of worship help us to know the God who is still speaking, and help us to help one another hear that that God calls each of our names. Welcome. I invite you to stand and join me as we sing together words from Psalm 95. The first time through, I will sing the refrain, and then each time after that, I'll invite you to join me.
please join me in the unison prayer. Our Lord, we know that when you speak to us, you call us to listen. But listening is often hard for us. There are so many other sounds we hear and thoughts we think which get in the way of us hearing you. Give us ears that hear well, minds that listen, and hearts that follow your word. Amen. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist. Here at First Baptist, we greet each other by passing the peace, saying, Peace of Christ be with you. Welcome again, especially to the college students. First Baptist has been my home away from home since I moved from Atlanta to study animal science at North Carolina A&T a year ago. Our college Bible studies are part of the reason I stayed. The lessons, fellowship, and food are all reasons to join us every Sunday after service. 
we'd love to have you. This is also a reminder that our midweek services start back on September 4th, not this week, but next week after Labor Day. And now we'll have Christina up for the blessing of the backpacks. So I know that when you often see me, you think of just children, but today I would love to invite not just our kids forward, but also our youth, college students, um, educators, anyone who um, is going back to school in whatever way um, that looks like. Everybody scoot in so we can make room for all of our friends, no matter your age. Yes. Good job. So this year's back to school theme is speak. And speaking is really important. Can you all tell me maybe what is one way or how can we speak? What do we use? Your vocal cords, okay, that's very specific. We use our vocal cords or our mouth, okay. What else? A very large mouth. Are you saying my mouth is large? Oh, yours is, okay. Uh, indigo. You use your lips and your tongue, okay. Besides this part of our body, what else could we use? Berkeley. Our actions, so it might be our hands. I have been known to use this, my face, you can usually tell what I'm saying or thinking by looking at my face, so I have to keep it in check sometimes. Um, we can use our body language. All right, anyone else want to share how else we can? Let's go, Perrin. Your voice, your voice box. Okay, you all are so smart. Well, most importantly, okay, awesome, thank you. So this year, um, I said our theme is speak. As you walked in, you all got a prayer card, but guess what? Every single person here that is in the sanctuary got a card. And on that card, it is a prayer that tells us how and what God speaks to us and also helps to remind us how and when and why, how we are supposed to speak to others. And one thing that is really important for us is to realize how God speaks to us. Now, we don't hear this big voice that says, I need you to know that you are beloved. I need you to know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I need you to know that you are going to be loved by me no matter what. How do we know the things that God says to us? How do we know those things that God says to us? David. From the Bible. From the Bible. Yes, we can read God's word to remind us what God says to us about who we are and how we are created in God's image. But you know what? We're to do something with that. Once we remember that we're beloved, once we remember that we can always look to the Bible to show us how to use our voice and our actions with others, we are called by God to also treat others as beloved children of God to remember and to remind them that they are fearfully and wonderfully made and to treat them as if they are loved beyond measure. And so now what we're going to do is we want to bless you all. We want to bless this new beginning, this new school year, whether you're going to school, in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, wherever you're going, whether you're a teacher or you work in a school, we're going to bless you. So now I want you all to make sure that we're listening to these words that are spoken and we're thinking about what those mean. All right? So y'all stay seated while we do our blessing.
So you and the congregation also have uh, a part in this blessing of our students and our educators. Uh, after each reader says, speak, Lord, you will respond by saying, your servant is listening. Lord, speak to us. As we approach a new school year, help us to hear you. In the midst of our excitement and nerves, help us to speak your goodness to those around us. Speak, Lord, your servant. Lord, help us to hear your voice. Open our eyes to pay attention to the ways that you teach us. Guide us in making good choices as we grow in wisdom and maturity. Be present with us in our classroom, on the school bus, on the playground, and in our cafeteria. Speak, Lord. Lord, we are wonderfully made. Remind us that we can walk with confidence into the school year, knowing that you are near. Help us to remember to find our identities in Christ and not in others. Speak, Lord. Lord, you love us beyond measure and say that we are enough. Help us to remember that your love never ends. Remind us that we are worthy in your eyes. No matter what our grades are or who our friends are, we can find our value in you. Speak, Lord. Lord, Lord, our voices matter. Give us curiosity to explore and ask questions. Even when we make mistakes, give us the confident to, confidence to boldly try again. May we words that we say and the words we do, ways that we speak, be pleasing to you. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Lord, help us to speak up for what is right. Open our eyes to those who are lonely, bullied, sad, and treated unfairly. Even when it's unpopular, guide us to use our voices to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Lord, may our words and actions speak your love. Open our hearts to see others the way that you do. Guide us to show love to those who are difficult to love. May others see Jesus through our words and our actions. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Lord, bless these backpacks, these school supplies, and the children who will use them. Let these physical gifts be symbols of the love and support that we give the students and teachers in our community throughout the year. Speak, Lord. So children, in a moment, if you're in first grade or younger, you're going to go to junior church, and everyone else will return to your seats. And as you go, there are going to be some adults who are in the front aisles here with some buttons. And on those buttons, there is a word. What word do you think it is? Speak. And so you can put that button on your backpack. You might want to put it on your jean jacket. You might want to put it somewhere special. But put it somewhere where you will be able to see that button. And will you, you will be able to remember to listen to what God says to us. But also that you can pay attention to the ways that you are to use your words and actions. And there's one part of that button that I'd love for you all to pay attention to. You'll see all these different colors, and it looks like these rainbows going out. And sometimes it can look like those colors are coming in. And so that can represent what God is speaking to us. But also, if you start in the middle of that button, it's going out. 
And that can remind us of what we are to use our voices and our actions and how we're to use them. All right? Will you make a... Before I have you all join me in prayer, I would like to draw your attention to the luminary that is lit. It's lit in memory of Polly Snow, the wife of Jack Snow, who passed, Polly passed earlier this week. Polly Snow was a member of our church for over 33 years, and many of you may remember her for, for her influence and for her instruction and her membership of the two by two Sunday school class. So please keep her family in your prayers, and if you all will join me in prayer. God of knowing all things, God who calls the name of prophets, God who calls the name, names of leaders, God who calls the name of Samuel, God who calls my name, and God who calls your name. God, we are here. Speak, because we are listening. And this may not always be the case. Oftentimes, God, you are showing the way and we have our heads turned. And this is not an intentional act of disobedience or maybe subconsciously it is. There are so many things going on around us, so many words buzzing through our minds and they consume so much of our energy. Yet you still call us by name. And sometimes we miss it. And yet you still continue to call on us. You continue to remind us that the names given to us by this world don't have to define who we are. We can claim and reclaim names past or let them go if they're restricting. And with so much going on, sometimes, God, we forget our names. Maybe not the name we were born with, but the names that were bestowed upon us our hearts at birth, names like child of God, beloved, earnest, brave, listener, caregiver, justice seeker, one who speaks up and speaks out, healer, leader, counselor, fixer, developer, creator, writer, oh God, speak, for we are listening. We lift up to you those who are in need of prayer. We lift up to you those who are in need of forgiveness, we lift up to you those who have forgotten who and whose they are. God, we lift up one another because the burden may be too much to bear. And no one person should have to lift it alone. We lift up all these things and call on you by name. God, Lord, Elohim. Amen.
like to thank Mason Duggins for opening our Bible today. He opened our Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord said, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am. And ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you. My son, go lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you again, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May we pray. Oh, loving God, in so many ways you are speaking. In so many ways you have spoken already this day through music and through the reading of your word, through the power of this community, and through all that we share in this time of worship. Help us, oh God, to listen. Even more, help us to hear. I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Speak when you're spoken to. Maybe you heard that instruction once upon a time. Maybe you've said it before. It's sometimes followed by the supporting notion that children should be seen but not heard. An idea that's meant to communicate respect, authority, and a clear and efficient sense of hierarchy. Of course, this familiar philosophy also assumes a couple of things. First, that a child is not a full person with a real voice. And second, that adults are always the ones with the important things to say. But Samuel is a child when we meet him. That's the first thing we hear in this passage, the boy. Samuel, the hero of the Jewish Christian faith, the anointer of kings, the prophet to the populace, he was at first the boy Samuel who heard from God. Tradition holds that he's around 12 years old in the passage we read today, but we meet him much earlier than that, as from his earliest days he was in the house of the Lord, brought there by his bold and faithful mother Hannah. He was dedicated to God, and as chapter 2 describes, he grew in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. And that's a comforting notion for many of us who have brought our youngest ones to church this morning on this back to school Sunday. It's also a move up Sunday, which means that kids have promoted to new grades in Sunday school, new classes on our children's wing. Some new second graders are sitting through a sermon for the very first time, and right about now they are wondering, wait, how long is he going to talk? The answer, kids, is 18 to 22 minutes. You can time me and let me know. The prayer does not count as part of the time, though. Now, this also means that some four-year-olds are in worship today for the very first time. Like a certain 
four-year-old from my family who has wandered out to junior church now, when his older siblings realized that this would be his very first Sunday in the sanctuary, the general consensus in our household was, oh no, (laughs) Warner's not ready, they said. Yes, the one that we call the wild man has only ever known the sanctuary as a place to run around laps and to crawl beneath the pews while waiting for his father to shake hands at the end of the service. So I imagine that this makes about as much sense as if we were all gathered in the church gym right about now. But then again, who's ready? Who's ever ready? Certainly, church doesn't exist for people who are ready. Church is not only for people who are composed or prepared or silent or meeting all standards of decorum, no. Many of you know that from 2005 to 2009, I served as an associate pastor at a church in Nashville, Emmanuel Baptist, a loving church that bears a lot of similarity to us here at First Baptist Greensboro. And part of my time overlapped with Emmanuel's interim pastor, who became a good friend to me to this day, Reverend Charles Pastor Johnson, Charlie. And he is this larger-than-life Texas preacher who is charismatic. He's somewhat iconoclastic. He has this engaging style and verve. He strides confidently about the pulpit. Today he is the head of an organization he founded called Pastors for Texas Children, which advocates for public schools in his home state. And he and Emmanuel Baptist matched about as well as his suits matched his snakeskin cowboy boots. It was a stylish match. It was bold. It was unconventional, but it worked beautifully. One particular Sunday, I remember especially, a church visitor and her toddler were sitting in the sanctuary somewhere near the back for the very first time. And this child had been making some noise through the service. There were cries and there were questions, and it was all provoking some sideways glances, some nervous shifting of weight in the seats. Now, everybody was kind so far, but there was some tension. I could feel it in my own shoulders sitting down front. And during the sermon, Charlie began to stride about the pulpit, and that's when the child's noise escalated. And finally, this mother, very hurriedly and and desperately, she got embarrassed and she gathered her things to leave quickly. And then Charlie just stopped his sermon and he said, Mama, you stay right there. That baby's a gift to this church. And the whole room did what you just did. The whole room changed. We could all feel it. I'd like to believe that even that child sensed it, that it told us something about who we are as a community and how our ability to welcome the restless and the unrestrained, it says something about our ability to welcome all of the people of God and the fullness of the work of God in this world. That child is a gift. And so Hannah believed it of her son, Samuel. And so we know it of the children, the youth, the young people who grace this place of worship, who grow in stature and favor in this house of the Lord. And we can see how it was true of Samuel. First, Samuel could hear what others could not hear. The word of the Lord was rare in those days, the passage describes. God was silent, at least from what most people could hear. This recalls for me a scene from George Bernard Shaw's play on the life of Joan of Arc. And the Archbishop and King Charles are interrogating Joan of Arc when the Archbishop asks her, how do you know you are right? And Joan answers, well, my voices. And the King interrupts, oh, your voices, your voices. Well, why don't your voices come to me? I'm the King, not you. And Joan responds, well, they do come, but you do not hear them. Samuel was listening, and Samuel could hear. He could hear 
what others could not hear. Samuel was lying down in the temple, the passage described, where the ark of God was. He was near to it, and the Lord called Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel could hear. And maybe it wasn't in spite of the fact that he was a boy, but precisely because of it. The poet Francis Thomas, the 19th century poet, once asked, Do you know what it is to be a child? It is to be something very different from the adult of today. It is to have a spirit yet streaming from the waters of baptism. It is to believe in love, to believe in loveliness, to believe in belief. Do you know this? And you know even more of what it is to be a child. It's to live with curiosity. It's to shed inhibition. It's to make noise freely. It's to dance readily. It's to ask good questions. Daddy, where does the ocean end? And why are you wearing a work shirt? It's Saturday. And when someone dies, why do we cry? All questions I've heard in the last week from my children that reflect a kind of freedom of thought and ease of expression that might enable someone to hear when God is silent and to see when visions are few. It's what the theologian Marcus Borg once described, telling of a young boy who was so excited to welcome his baby sister. And when she came into the world and into the home, the boy was just in love. He wanted to hold her. He wanted to play with her. He wanted to talk to her. And one day, his mother came into the room and overheard him at her crib saying to his baby sister, Can you tell me about God? I think I'm forgetting. Maybe you've forgotten. Well, they were forgetting in Israel, rulers and priests and all manner of important people with supposedly all the right things to say, they were forgetting. I imagine that their names were being called, some of them too, but they weren't being heard. But this boy, Samuel, with his openness, with his proximity to his Creator, with his abundant curiosity, could hear what others could not. Which leads Samuel to do a second thing. He got up, the text describes, and he went to Eli. Once Samuel hears, he goes to someone that he trusts. Now, Eli was not perfect. In fact, right after the text describes the rare visions of that time, it tells of Eli's failing eyesight. He was the embodiment of the people's own impairment, you see. And just before our text, in chapter 2, we learn of this string of injustices that come from Eli's sons, which the priest does nothing to correct, despite the strongest urgings. He was not perfect. No, the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and it's no exaggeration to say that Eli carries some of the blame for that. He can't hear God himself. Not any longer. But he helps Samuel to hear. Samuel cannot recognize God's voice on his own. It is Eli who first realizes, realizes that the Lord is attempting to speak to the boy. And Samuel does not know what to say. And so it's Eli that teaches him to form those words, enduring to say, Here I am. Samuel still wonders why this word has come to him at all. And it's Eli who tells him later in the passage, it is the Lord, Samuel. Because most people don't hear God without Eli. We all need those people that we can go to when we hear something we don't understand. Or when we find ourselves in a place where the way is not yet clear. My friend Dr. John Roberts is a retired minister who served with me in the board of Wake Divinity School a few years ago. And I got to benefit from his stories and his wisdom a couple times a year at meetings. Like once over lunch when he told me about the favorite children's sermon that he had given in his career. It had been years ago and he gathered all of the children around and he told them the story of Lazarus that we know. And he imagined with them a particular detail of the story. What must it have been like, children? For Lazarus, waking up in that tomb, still tied up in his grave clothes, he couldn't see. He probably couldn't move. 
And to illustrate, Dr. Roberts had one willing child stand up, and he wrapped him up in paper towels from head all the way down to toe. How's he going to move? He asked the other kids. He can't walk. He can't run, can he? How's he going to move? And finally the kids shouted, well, he'll have to hop. That's right, Dr. Roberts said. And then he began to teach the kids something he called the Lazarus Hop. And it went like this. Everybody stood up, and then the organist played the theme of the Adams Family. Da-na-na-na. Only instead of the snap, they would hop. Da-na-na-na, hop, hop. That's the only time I'm doing it. Da-na-na-na. Hop, hop, da na na na, hop, da na na na, hop, da na na na, hop, hop. And on and on it went. The whole sanctuary is filling up with laughter at all of these hopping kids and plenty of adults moving in their seats until the music just stopped abruptly and Dr. Roberts crouched down. Come here, children, he said. And in a soft voice, he told them, There will be times in your life when you feel bound up. When you can't see where you're going. When maybe you feel like you can't even move. And I want you to remember in those moments to listen for the voices that you trust. And whatever it takes, I want you to move towards those voices even if you have to hop. And so yes, children, move to those you can trust. And yes, church, Let us move to those that we can trust. And what's more, let us be those that one another can trust. There is no more important role for the church to play than to help women and men and all people, children and youth in all ages, hear and discern the voice of God that calls each of our names. And so Samuel got up and he went to Eli and our church is full of such people. They are Sunday school teachers and youth leaders and music directors and ministers and friends who shake hands in the pews and pass a word of peace and those who sit around tables midweek for a meal and those who come to us when we're grieving and those who share in the fullness of our joy in times of celebration. Those who, when any of us is lying in the dark, we can get up and approach, can learn that God is speaking still And we're not perfect, but we can help one another to know the voice of God that calls for us. Samuel went to Eli. And he went to Eli because he trusted him, yes. But I think there was another reason he went to Eli because he thought God's voice was Eli's voice. In other words, God's voice To Samuel, it sounded like Eli's voice. Have you ever considered that your voice might sound like God's voice? Well, it's so important to remember as we consider the next thing that Samuel does. Because Samuel, through the wisdom of Eli, through the voice of God calling to him, Samuel comes to realize that he has a voice too. That he's not merely a listener, he's a speaker. God helps Samuel to learn how to speak when spoken to, you see. That is, when God has spoken to you the truth of who you are, you are to speak the same to others. It's what Christina shared so beautifully with all of us today, and especially with our students and teachers. It's what's written in the prayer that you have hopefully picked up on this card today. Lord, speak to me. And then, Lord, help me to use my voice for what is right. Help me to speak love to all of your people. Help me to speak up for what is true and just and holy. May I speak as you have spoken to me, Lord. And so Samuel does. He grows to become this prophet who speaks for the Lord. Samuel is the one who breaks the divine silence in those days as Samuel's words, the passage tells us later, they came to all of Israel. And all of this 
from the boy who was lying down in the dark in the temple. Now, I don't mean to idealize him. And I certainly don't mean to romanticize the experience of childhood or children today. In fact, in the ancient world, in Samuel's time, children were not primarily understood as adorable or as innocent, as angelic or idyllic. No, they were often seen as a burden. They were sometimes compared to servants in a household economy. Fewer than half of children born made it to adulthood. In fact, in other words, the most salient characteristic of a child in the ancient world is that they were extraordinarily vulnerable. They were perhaps the most vulnerable beings in their society. And don't miss the meaning here. That means that God speaks to those who are the most vulnerable. And so God calls us to be a church for those who are most vulnerable, most marginalized, most forgotten, those who have been seen but not really heard. And those who have been treated by this world and its systems as though they are dispensable and expendable should wait to speak, should be patient to act. Should let others tell them what God is doing and what God is saying and what God is up to. In fact, they are the ones to whom the voice of God comes when others can't hear. And they are the ones who come to speak the voice of God amidst a time that is otherwise silent. And later in the story, one who comes well after Samuel, one descended from the king that Samuel himself will anoint. Well, that one, Jesus, declares that our ability to welcome the vulnerable, the children, that it is a direct reflection of our ability to welcome the kingdom of God in our midst. It was a few years ago, and a family had brought their young children church. For one of the first times, they had brought the children to this church, in fact. They were somewhere near the back. They were trying to occupy their young kids. They were probably wondering if everything was okay. They were feeling a bit uncertain. And those children, well, you know, they were probably just wanting to crawl beneath the pews or run laps down the aisles. Now, in front of this family, there were some of our longer-term experienced members. And so this family worried that they were disturbing people as they rustled papers, as they opened up the occasional peppermint as quietly as they could. As they worried that the questions their children asked would cause people to turn around in their seats. And so this went on for the whole of the service, interspersed with breaks for bathroom and water when allowed, when at the end, a member seated in front of them turned around and said to them, I want you to know, she said, that all that noise in the service, it was just the best part of my week. Yes, may this be a church where anyone who has ever seemed not quite ready, where anyone, any single one who has ever felt vulnerable in this world or forgotten or overlooked or overshadowed or seen and not heard, where any single one finds us all echoing the words that that saint said that day. I'm so glad you were here. We need those voices. Amen. This is not a passage or a sermon about children. It's about all of us. It's about all of us in this world who can sometimes feel overlooked or forgotten, learning again that God speaks our names and calls us to speak the names of others. 
And so let us now commit ourselves to that work once again as we stand and sing a hymn of commitment. And if your commitment today is public, maybe you want to become a member of this church. Maybe you want to profess something about your faith. Maybe you want to be baptized and request that this morning. The way we do that is you can meet me right down front as we all stand and sing together our hymn of response. As Deacon Adam Duggins comes to lead us in offertory prayer and we all consider what we give back to God, would also remind this is a chance to use the connection card you find in your bulletin to share a prayer request with us, maybe to make a meal reservation for our upcoming midweek services that begin on September the 6th. Or if you're a guest with us today, we would love to have a record of your attendance. So you can fill this out, love to send you a note, and you can drop this in the offering plate as it comes by in a moment. Let us pray. As we enter a new school year, be with our kids, 
and our teachers as they enter new situations, new grades, and new schools. Help us to use our resources, time, and energy to help those families and children in need for a successful school year. Empower us as a congregation to give freely and generously to share your love and bless all the gifts and resources that we give today. In your name we pray. Amen. can never fail. Let their truth prevail. Truth prevail over unbelief. And by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O oh Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled.
a beautiful day of worship, and we are so grateful you were a part of it, grateful to Jeff Perry, to our music ministry, the wonderful gifts that were shared, so grateful to our Minister of Children, Christina McCord, and our entire children's ministry team for their leadership today, as well as our youth minister, Chris Cherry, and his leadership with our youth in this day of promotion and transition and welcoming new members to children's ministry and youth group. Among the offerings today, we also want to acknowledge the school supplies that were brought by many of our children that will be donated to Bessemer Elementary School, meeting some of the items on a wish list that their teachers put together. So we are grateful for those offerings and all the offerings given in this place. And I'd like to say one more thing as we think about the unseen things that happen to make possible the work that we do together in worship. There was a flood this weekend in this building. And I think it's important for all of us to know just how much work was done Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday by so many and by our building team to make it possible for us to be here to, to reduce the damage to our downstairs buildings where the flooding came in. Just another reminder of the unseen work that all of us are called to do. We're grateful for it, and we're grateful for all of the Elis that do that work and help us to hear the voice of God speaking to us, even as God's voice has spoken today. As we go from this place preparing to speak those words ourselves, hear these words of benediction as we go. Now go in peace, dear friends, and as you go, it is so important that you remember just who you are, that you are daughters and sons, beloved children of a living God, and that you are friends and companions of Jesus our Christ, and that through the power of the Spirit, the love of Christ is it loose in this world through your very lives. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you.